Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report. We've got a remarkable panel. Of course, one of our most popular hours of the week is the third hour on Friday, prepared in civil defense, earth changes in space weather, and, of course, monitoring all the international vac- viruses like coronavirus uh, 2 coming from Saudi Arabia, the Middle East, uh, the H7N9, and much more. And we have John Moore, who has his own radio show co-host, Ann Morrison. And joining us probably quarter past uh, the hour, we'll have a short report from Professor James McCanny. Uh, John and Ann, what are the latest uh, in, in, that you're presenting on your show, and what's the latest on the radar? Because I know, Ann, you have a lot of research you've done. We talked about it this morning, so I'm going to not steal your thunder. Tell us what's up. Go ahead, Ann. Oh, okay. Well, we have a new update on the uh, MERS, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, and uh, so that we need to talk about that perhaps. And uh, then <clears throat> we've had a CME hit the earth, and... Uh, it, is, it has given us aurora borealis that is far south as Kansas, and uh, these aurora borealis lights are very bright red, and that's very unusual. Auroras are usually green and sometimes purple, but we normally don't see uh, this much this much red. And uh, I believe, oh, and by the way, these auroras are being seen around the world and under the world. In other words, they're being seen as as far south as Kansas in the Northern Hemisphere and in New Zealand in the Southern Hemisphere. Now the the bright red is probably being caused by strontium salts, probably strontium carbonate. The strontium, I believe, is coming from Fukushima. Uh, Strontium-90 is one of the fission products. And uh, so uh, if we have strontium around the world now, everybody in the world is subject to uh, intaking uptaking uh, strontium as calcium, and that will be stored in the body as calcium, but the body cannot use it like it uses calcium. So it will be stored in the bones and in the muscles, and uh, one of the effects of that is um, heart attacks. And uh, I bet the last time you went in to see your your doctor, he didn't tell you that you should uh, be worried about radiation, but you should. Right, well, it was a uh Strontium and, of course, uh, both cesium-131 or 137 are what's called cardiotoxic. Um, and what they do is they act as an analog of calcium, but what they do is they're much more active because they have a beta particle emission. And they, they turn from strontium into yttrium. And, in fact, the electron or the beta particle emission is so powerful, even if it hits lead shielding, it can actually generate X-rays. So you can't have lead shielding if someone's got acute strontium-90 poisoning because you'll actually generate more X-rays in the department. Uh, it's pretty strange, but that's true. The, um, <clears throat> a lot of people that uh, died after Chernobyl uh, died of actually cardiac arrhythmias and cardiac arrest and vascular disease. And the rate of stroke in Japan since Fukushima Daiichi has gone up by 3,500%, 35 times. And that's because people aren't dying of cancer yet. Uh, the cancers will happen in waves. And, of course, there will be certain cancers are much more early on, some types of lymphoma and so on that start relatively quickly. Other cancers may take years before they actually mature. But vascular disease, neurological disease, breaking down the blood-brain barrier, and what's called super infections where the immune system and mitochondrial failure happens much earlier. So you have people dying of pneumonia, dying of intercurrent infections, <clears throat> the uh, very elderly, the very young, they're going to die quicker, and the cause of death may not be directly linked to radiation, but it is. So the numbers that they quote right now, between 22,000 and 85,000 dead in America since Fukushima Daiichi are probably lower than they should be. Uh, we know that the neonatal nursery death rate went up within four to six weeks in Pennsylvania, which is a long way from Japan, went up 42%, and the only uh, statistical factor that was changed was Fukushima Daiichi and airborne radiation. So, and the radiation, by the way, the levels are now higher than they were back in March of 2011. Well, and that's even true in the uh, in the plume that's crossing the Pacific that's due into Hawaii in 2014 and to the west coast of the United States in 2015. Uh, yeah. The radiation is is stronger now, and you can say, well, how can that be? Because we're used to things that get diluted. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is just radiation- getting ahead of steam on, isn't it? Well, yeah, because when I, when a uh, isotope decays, it might create two or three daughters, and each one of them will decay, and so then you have triple the effects that you would if you just had that one, that one isotope. 
Well, on site, there's three things going on. The first is that the zirconium cladding on the fuel rod assembly bundles creates hydrogen, so you get hydrogen explosions. The second is what's called a lava lamp effect of the corium. And as more of the corium falls down, especially these fuel rod assembly cooling pools, which have got tremendous amounts of radiation, you're going to see much more hydrovolcanic and nuclear explosions. And they're going to release a lot more radiation. Some of it will actually vent out underneath the reactor site, out toward the ocean floor miles away, or in toward land, toward fault lines that can carry it all the way to the tube train system in northern Tokyo, in the suburbs of Tokyo or in the outer lying areas. Um, the next thing, of course, is you're going to get what's called, I call uh, burps or bursts of radiation. Our radiation level now, since they had the typhoon a, week, a little over a week ago, they released, they say, 1,000 tons. It's probably considerably more than that. The level of radiation is 22,000 times more radioactive than allowed into the ocean, and they're just letting it in. Uh, they're not doing anything to stop it. They, they, they Even the, the lower uh, parts of the so-called containers are actually squirting out radioactive water toward the workers. There's no way they can get in there safely and do anything now. Um, it, it's literally turned to a radioactive uh, oatmeal mush, and so the subsidence of the buildings means they're going to collapse, and when they do... We're, if they try to pull the fuel rod assemblies or it just happens spontaneously, we're going to get a thing called a pyrophoric fire where these fuel rod assemblies will go on fire. So a very bad situation indeed. Um, and it means basically we're in the worst environmental disaster in human history, which is killing the unborn and the elderly, speeding vascular disease, accelerating the onset of things like mitochondrial failure, which is conditions like diabetes and vascular problems. So the rates of many illnesses are going to go up dramatically, and people will not say, well, is that Fukushima doing it? Yes. Fukushima is a major driver for worldwide genocide, and it's happening as we speak. Well, I'm just dismayed that the uh, that all this money that we send, uh, that we donate for uh, research into vascular diseases and heart disease and heart attacks, they don't even mention radiation. They don't even mention the fact that we have been a subject to exposure by more radiation than our grandparents ever were. Well, they know that from Chernobyl. I mean, if you actually talk to doctors from Chernobyl, I took care of, we, of people actually migrated from uh, the Chernobyl area in Ukraine and Belarusia that were exposed downwind to radiation. And we saw the young people and older people, and a lot of the younger people in their 20s and 30s had heart attacks and strokes. Um, let's switch back for a second here and go to this to the SARS coronavirus, because this is a big deal. The Hajj is coming on next later this month. And 3 million people for, that are coming back from Saudi Arabia have to go around the Kaaba, which is a big meteorite, has lots of holes where they shove their prayers into it, and then kind of swarm around it, so it's very close human contact. The latest research is that there are multiple versions of virus growing in the same individual, and the only way to get an accurate culture is deep in the lungs. The, one of the reports you sent to me was interesting. I want you to read it and tell me what you think it means, and then we'll kind of comment on that. Well, they, they put out a new update, the World Health Organization and also the Ministry of Health from Saudi Arabia, and uh, this has to do with uh, the... Uh, the MERS, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, and uh, they're talking about the time period between June and September 2013. By the way, there haven't been any new cases uh, published since September 18th. So um, all of the cases, in all of these cases, have been directly or indirectly linked through travel to or for a, re <laughs> a residence in four countries. So these are the four countries, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Jordan, and the United Arab Emirates. They're no longer um, sending the sick people to Germany or to Britain or to the Netherlands. They're, they're taking them all, they're keeping them all within wh whatever country, either Saudi Arabia or Qatar or Jordan or the United Arab Emirates where, the, where they fall sick. Yeah. And um, no cases have been reported in the United States, but 82 persons from 29 states have been tested for the MERS yeah. but, coronavirus. Uh, but if, what I heard in the comments by Henry L. Nyman is they were culturing from their throat, which is useless because most cases are mild. If it goes to your deep lungs, you have to do a bronchoscopy and aspiration. You actually have to put a scope down and aspirate. And uh, the virus is not easy to culture out, but you have to do a deep aspiration to get anything. Uh, so they're sloppy. Welcome back. And uh, John, you have a comment that's really important people to right. grasp uh, about. Apparently, uh, last week, September 27th, the CDC has determined that the MERS virus is, is and has been added to the list of federal isolation 
and quarantine uh, diseases. That's under Executive Order 13295. So it's added to the list, and when it shows up here, uh, they will be able to quarantine and isolate people. Yeah. Um, well, one of the things that uh, I think people should grasp is that the uh, the government knows that, the, that we're going to have an airborne plague. It's a matter of just when it happens, not if it's going to happen. Uh, we have three candidate viruses at least. We've got uh, the beta coronavirus from Saudi Arabia. We've got H7N9. We have the reemergent uh, h 3N2V that's getting the lethal genes from H1N1 came in 2009. And back in the background, we've got H5N1. It's still trundling along, but it's embedded now in the bird populations everywhere on Earth. All it has to do is get the receptor binding domain from the human chromosomes by co-infecting in a host. And all of a sudden, this could burst on the scene and be as deadly as ever. The most deadly one, and the one that replicates the fastest, uh, the, the actual term is a replication index. I think it normal is one. I think uh, H7N9 has got a replication index. I think it's over three, which means the actual virus is replicating around 80,000 times faster than uh, any other virus. It's kind of it's an exponential uh, index, which means this virus can not only mutate but re-adapt uh, to environmental changes very, very quickly. Uh, it means that H7N9 is probably going to be the, the biggest and baddest one. The uh, coronavirus... It's going to persist. It's going to hang around for a long time, which means it's going to probably arrive, stay, cause mild cold or infection. Some people and other people, it'll kill you. Uh, that's how I think H- the beta coronavirus is going to be. But the H7N9 is one that's going to be the big behemoth, I think, the one from uh, Xingdang province in China that's already got a case fatality rate in the, in, in the 40% range plus. Yes, and it is unlike other avian flus. It is an avian flu, but unlike any other avian flu, it uh, resides in the mouth, the nose, the, uh, the throat. Yeah, it, and so it'll grow at lower temperatures uh, because birds are pretty hot, but it'll grow at low temperatures, which is really unusual for an avian uh, source flu. And that means <clears> that you can catch it by uh, coughing or sneezing. Yeah, so, so it's going to be spread spreading it. the way, you know, like the contagion that show that happened a few years ago, they had it. Um, on the, the movie theaters, um, John, what, what are the news are you tracking in terms of what's called the, the the budget shutdown? Because I'm seeing a lot of stuff on Drudge. Uh, a lot right. of vets are pretty ticked off. They've increased the barrier. That lady who was killed the other day was a single mother that apparently had a history of mental illness. Right. We also had the border patrol guards told him to stand down. In the meantime, we had Nancy Pelosi. This is literally the same day that uh, the unbirthday for Obamacare happened. She's announcing, and she's a crazy lady. She should be in a locked ward. Says we now want to have amnesty. I'm thinking, no, we want to have an accelerated citizenship program. Make sure people learn the language, learn the uh, skills. Don't have to pay exorbitant fees. Can get a proper, uh, you know, uh, card to, to be here. But they should only be here in America if they're not criminals. If they're criminals, whether they're working or they're applying for citizenship, they should not be inside our borders. It's ridiculous. And that includes, by the way, military personnel who did two or three terms, for example, even in the military service, and it turns out they were a murderer in El Salvador. What are they doing in Los Angeles or Chicago? They shouldn't be here. Right. Well, we're the only country in the world that has this dilemma. Uh, some, some European com- countries have had uh, immigration laws that were uh, far and, ha- and still are too, far too loose, but they do enforce their immigration laws, uh, where we are just letting ours slide and... Uh, we've become the laughing stock of the world because of it. Nobody, we, we just are not enforcing our existing laws. That's because they want to make a trade zone. America is a trade zone. Canada, the United States, Mexico is one big trade country. Uh, and they want free trade, basically, with Mexican population, Canadian population just migrating in and out. But Obama's even passed a recommendation in executive order saying we want to make humanitarian uh, exceptions to allow people from Muslim countries to come here because of global uh, climate change or war. So if there's major war in the Middle East or if there's major climate change, they want to have a massive insurgence into America of Muslims. Uh, on top of that, for every person that comes here illegally, it's all the relatives will be coming too because of the anchor baby thing. And right. you're not talking about 10 or 20 or 30 million people. You're soon going to be talking about 100 million or more. Uh, this is not rational. You don't have a green card or a work visa where you can come and work and go back home, And which people, by the way, most people from Mexico want to go back to their hometown. They just want to make sure the town, hometown doesn't have drug lords that are supported by our government, because they are. They want to make sure they're not arming like Fast and Furious. They want to have a decent economy, because, by the way, if you study it closely, you'll see that the economy in Mexico was killed by free trade. Free trade actually killed the Mexican economy. 
And after they killed it, then they tried to force the people to come up to America, and then they clamped down on them. So all of this is all a game. And, you know, why are you building a wall between Mexico and America, which is the most serious wall compared to the wall around Israel? At the same time, you're going to have, quote, amnesty. It, it's schizophrenic. It doesn't make sense, does it? It is. It is schizophrenic. A lot of things our government does is schizophrenic. What they're doing with this uh, shutdown is, is grandstanding. Uh, Lincoln Memorial and, and the World War II Memorial are open monuments with no guards, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, <laughs> with no manning. Uh, so uh, it's, it's grandstanding to put fences around uh, open memorials like this, uh, and, and, they're, and I understand the White House is requesting people send them stories about how the uh, shutdown is affecting them. And, and ver- I think what they, Obama basically is a maniac, and of course he wants he's big giving the people of, of America a middle finger, and he's deciding to say, you know, hey, you senior citizens, don't worry, Grandpa Obama's here, but by the way, these bad Republicans, they're taking away your senior citizens check. What? I mean, he's, he's doubling down already. Obama is, uh, some people think he's a good poker player. I think he's going to blow up. I think that he needs to be impeached over this issue along with all the other things he's done. But if this drags out beyond the 17th and they don't come to a resolution, the next step is the Republicans who have now shown a little resolve need to decide to start impeaching him. And need to also impeach the members of the, of the Senate, including Harry Reid, who hasn't had a balanced budget in five years. These people are nuts. They don't understand there's no need for this at all. If they pass the glass steagle we can get back to a balanced budget. We could become the first world producer of oil, which would make us automatically have tons of money. Uh, we need to bring have proper tariffs so we can bring our industry back to America. We need to have a proper work visa system that checks people's background. So if they want to work here, fine. But you're not going to be allowed in the doors, even if you served a term or two in the military, if you're a criminal. And if we want a system that works faster so people aren't harmed either way, where they have kids that have been here for you know 20 years or 18 years, and their father has been sent back to Mexico. That's stupid. If he's not a criminal, he wants to work here. Give him a work card. But he's not an American unless he goes through the process, which could take eight or ten years. That's okay. You don't want to have all of a sudden an explosion of pseudo-Democrats who don't even speak English, who uh, basically are integrated into the medical into the system of being an American, no matter what their background. Uh, what Obama's trying to do is deconstruct America. He is. <clears throat> Absolutely he is. And he needs to be stopped. Yeah, uh, and it's up to Congress to stop him. Uh, the House Judiciary Committee is where bills of impeachment, articles of impeachment, originate. Uh, so far, after five years, they've shown no courage to do the right thing. Although well, the, uh, <laughs> I think they might show courage after the bond market run starts happening, because the dollar is going to be devalued probably before Thanksgiving at this current rate. If the seventeenth passes and they haven't found a resolution, the next step is a bond market run. You're going to see your gold coins and your gold and silver go crazy, and there's nothing that the plunge protection team can do to stop the mess that's going to happen. And uh, if you think it's just seniors not going to get checks, guess what? It's going to get systemic. Welcome back. John, let's turn to prepping. You're a prepping expert, and I tell people if you want to get a consultant that will help you prep whether you're packing to go to the Cook Islands in a container or you just want to know what to do, um, it's simple things a lot of times people forget. We have the 10-plus list we put up in the preparedness area. But we have a couple of things likely to happen. Uh, I think one of the first things the government will do if there's any kind of march of disruption, whether it's an airborne plague or a presumed cyber attack or you know um, any of these things, they're going to shut the power off. And I tell people they should be prepared for at least a coronal mass ejection, spontaneously by the sun, shutting off the power, at least the satellites and all pieces of the power grid network. Um, and I think that people aren't prepared for that. They're not prepared to even have stored water. They don't have food. They don't have self-protection. They're just not ready for anything, are they? Um, what would you tell people for this particular kind of set of events in the next, say, six months? What are the key things they need to prepare with? In a major metropolitan area, would, would be a nightmare for most people. Uh, uh, they would not have the resources to survive for very long, especially uh, in the northern areas where it gets really cold. Uh, if you were going to survive in a, in a major urban area uh, without power, you, you better have uh, a deep stock of fuel, 
uh, high walls, 10-foot walls, uh, plenty of weapons, and uh, 10,000 gallons of water, uh, it would be extremely difficult and very dangerous. Uh, you're far better off being away from the cities in a less populated area where you can heat with wood, uh, as long as the EPA doesn't take our wood stoves away, by the way, um, and have a source of water that you own and you control, along with uh, uh, a stock of food that can be replenished in the spring when the, when the spring crops are planted. So being self-sufficient in the country is a far better idea than trying to tough it out in an urban area. Yeah, exactly. Now, uh, where I'm personally located is outside the town or cities, near Camp Pendleton, but up in the mountains. Where we are is a gated community on the side of a blue a granite mountain, and it's very defensible. Uh, what I tell people, the minimum thing is you need to have, I like the John Moore rule, two, from one, two is one and one is none. Uh, that means uh, if you have water filtration systems, have two. If you have two sources of water, have two. You know, have a roof water system, have a, a collection system where you can even collect water from, uh, you know, if you have a pool or some other collector, uh, and ideally even a third system like a well. Uh, be prepared for backup power. You know, I just uh, spoke this morning to uh, to the director, uh, Robert Styler of V3 Solar. He'll be in on Monday. Uh, they're the ones that developed not only the V3 Solar spinning uh, solar conversion power systems. One little dome, uh, two feet across and two feet high, will generate a kilowatt of power. Those will be available uh, probably in the second quarter, maybe the third quarter next year. Plus, they also have technology for a storage system. Uh, three storage systems we're looking at right now is number one, lithium pyrophosphate batteries are the best with power controllers. So whether you get wind, solar, or if you have propane, because we have a 20 kilowatt backup propane generator, uh, you want to have those. You also want to protect them with a Faraday cage over your integrated circuits because the the first thing to go is satellite. Second is ground based power generation uh, distribution networks. Third is going to be a home electronics and things anything from your your electronic stove to refrigerator and your personal electronics. And the fourth and last thing to go is cars because they're grounded. But right. uh, And they're also inside cars, a steel box. Cars are like not an, grounded. That's why they don't go. They're not grounded, yeah. And because they're also in a steel box and they're not grounded, they're unlikely to develop a, uh, you know, induced current that creates a problem. So um, <clears throat> the V3 Solar is going to be a real big solution. Uh, they have their own storage systems. That will probably be the second or third quarter next year. Uh, I tell people at the very least... They probably should, and this is for my solutions, I think that a propane-powered uh, backup generator, 20 kilowatt uh, from Generac, is, is probably the best step, first step solution because you can get a power controller that can take multiple sources. If you then get a power controller with lithium pyrophosphate batteries, you can run your generator just two hours a day. And the rest of the day when you don't need high power because you're not washing or cooking or doing other things, you could just run on batteries. Right. Uh, that's smart. And I, I, and I tell people, have a backup, have wood stove, uh, have inserts if you have a, a propane-style uh, you know, fireplace, put an insert so you can actually boil water and cook on it. And even if you've got a fancy flat top and you've got induction heat and all the other stuff, assume that if two is one, one is none, you know, the same way with backup food. You know, you can have your prepare-wise food, and you better have a garden and a greenhouse. You better be prepared for any eventuality, including the number of people that show up that you didn't expect to show up to their friends, and you're not going to turn them away or shoot them. So you got to be prepared for lots of eventualities that are going to screw up all your plans. You know, like Robbie Burns once said, the best laid plans of mice and men gain after glay, which in Gaelic means are often go astray. They do. So, uh, so what other things would you recommend, John? Well, you... We covered quite a bit already. Uh, you want to be sure you have a source of pot- potable water that you own and you control. Uh, your food squared away, and, and make sure it's food that if you have small children and older folks, uh, those are two groups that will not eat unfamiliar food. Uh, children right. under five, uh, people over over seventy-five or eighty. Uh, make sure you got a way to defend yourself, a way to communicate. We'll talk to people that you care about, and also to intercept. All the emergency frequencies in your in your town, in your county, in your state. Uh, exactly. The, police, the fire, the paramedics, the uh, fire. Yeah, and, it, uh, everybody. Yeah, in other words, have like a like a walkie-talkie system. By the way, we now have Professor uh, James McCanny. Uh, Professor McCanny, can you give us an update of what's going on with the, as you mentioned yesterday on the program, the uh, Mars Went Comet? I like that uh, term. 
what's happening and what's likely to happen as we approach the November 13th deadline, where we now have a parallel blackout of information flowing from this and disinformation ops going on, which are directly abusing your information and scientific discoveries. At the same time, they're putting the public in danger of not knowing what's going to happen next. What's happening? Oh, well, uh, I got an interesting email today, uh, actually it's forwarded from uh, some of the staff at Joyce Riley, and it said that NASA is going to make some kind of big announcement on November 13th, some major discovery. <laughs> so we all thought that was rather interesting, but uh, when you go to the webpage, it's a, it's a malware webpage. So I don't know. It's, Things are getting strange. Uh, the, the things are spoofy. Yeah. If you go to the website, I heard about that. There's also a spoof page talking about some major disaster that's going to happen. Yes, I, I think that the uh, the uh, government is doing every kind of activity we call psyop against the population. When the outgoing director of DHS says there's a hundred percent chance of a CME striking the earth, how would she know? I mean, as I yeah. tell people, hitting the earth with a uh, let's say a, a fifty caliber weapon which is anti-aircraft weapon, is like hitting an egg at 150 to 200 yards. It's not easy. You know, no, uh, why exactly. do they think that they can say absolutely anything? Even if there is a superstorm on the sun, do they know? Do they have some kind of crystal ball or they've gone to the future and come back? You know, how would they know this stuff? It's, uh, yeah. it's it, and, then, and then they mix it with uh, cybernetic terrorism. Uh, you know, yeah. then they kind of disabuse the fact that they don't, they don't want to tell you that as these comments come in, like citing spring next year, these comments are dangerous. This is totally aside from the issue of people trying to throw in the Planet X stuff, which may be way out there. The real issue is we got something from coming at us now. It's like people worry about hitting, being hit with mortar when you got a guy with an automatic weapon shooting 100 bullets at your head. It's like you need to worry about bullets, not mortar. You know, yeah, Comments I, are happening right now, and they're dangerous. Another issue that's going on is uh, there are dozens upon dozens upon dozens of misinformation pieces using my name, using clips of 2002 radio shows, uh, putting, putting them, pasting them together. One of them that's been prevalent on YouTube where I'm supposedly saying there's a solar system coming in, like a Nibiru solar system coming in to our solar system, and that's totally misinformation. They right. totally created misinformation. But here's what I want to tell people. Sometimes people post things on web pages or on blogs and they copy them, but in their wake is the what we call the trolls, the Internet trolls that work for the government. They're right. pasting all that other garbage around my name. So I'm telling people, you know, just if, if they want to do me a favor and do everybody else a favor, Simply put a link to my web page where people can go there and see what I'm saying, not exactly, on some, yeah. somebody's blog right. that, that gets hammered yeah. with other misinformation. Right, and of course you're not diminishing the danger of ISON, um, but we have to be a balanced in terms of our approach to this, and we also have to think, well, why is the government doing all this NERC trial when they haven't hardened the grid? This is craziness. Just change the name again. Of course, I like to change with the name of Obama to I call him the Abomination, but I got a new one because we're approaching Halloween. I'm going to call him Obu Mila. Mila. Obu Mila. He's going to scare all the seniors. He wants to scare people with blocking out things that are open monuments like the Lincoln Memorial, as you said, John. That's really funny that your mind would think like that. Yeah, what are they going to do? Spray paint it? I mean, come on. <clears throat> what do they think they're going to do? They don't even have a guard there. They just want to aggravate people, frighten them, maybe frighten the bond markets and the stock markets so they can shake it. Every time that somebody comes on, like the you know the Fed Reserve Chairman comes on Bernanke, I call the teddy bear from hell. That's what he looks like with that little short crop beard. He looks like, ooh, this looks like a teddy bear got out of Hades. Uh, you know, and every statement they make is, oh, my gosh, the stock market goes up or gyrates down or whatever, whatever word he says. And I think Obama and these people really are trying to blow it's a controlled demolition of the economy. People need to grasp that. And by the way, there's elements in both parties, Republic crap and Democrat, that are behind this because there's elements in the Republican Party know that they're politicking this and figure, well, we'll get control of the Senate next year. 
I don't know. You don't want to. Is it going to be still in America? Are we going to be in the Hunger Games? What's going to happen, Professor McKenney? You've got lots to say about this uh, uh, issue in terms of what they're doing with your data. What's happening? Well, uh, the last uh, two weeks with Comet Ison were very interesting. On the twenty fourth of September, it turned green, which is an indication it is becoming very excited. It's lighting up like a neon light bulb, basically. Uh, right. That's. Uh, CO, which, by the way, only does that in the, uh, on our knowledge on Earth in a heavy welding arc type scenario. That green uh, glow that you see when a welding arc is going, that's carbon monoxide green. That's what right. it is. Uh, and that's what Comet Ison was doing. Okay, on the 29th, it developed a sunward spike as it approached Mars for its October 1st closest approach. And then I was watching... Uh, Tuesday morning, right before I was on with John Moore there on the show, and uh, that morning I saw the uh, the glow around Mars and in in indicating that Mars went comet. It's a term I developed because there is no such term in science. But um, Comet Ison moved in front of the planet Mars and uh, off the, uh, a little bit above it, but Mars, and you can see the connection between the comet and Mars with the tail of comet ice on connecting to Mars. And then I saw the glow around Mars just like a comet, a slight halo. And so indicating that when comet ice on, if it holds together, which I assume it's going to, as we move into November, November 10th to the 13th and 14th, when ISON has a backdoor perfect electrical alignment with the with the planet Mercury, uh, I'm expecting, and it's hard to predict, predictions are difficult to make, but I want everybody watching early in the morning from about the 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th of November, looking at the planet Mercury. It's in the early morning sky. Comet ISON will be up above it, uh, right up above it in the morning sky, and I'm expecting that Given that Mars went comet from that close approach, that the planet Mercury, we may be able to see naked eye comet developing around Mercury. And that is huge. This is an event that, um, how is NASA going to explain this? And I'm hoping it happens either with binocular visibility or with naked eye visibility. How would NASA explain this? Because Mercury has been well examined, well studied by spacecraft. It's bone dry. There's not a trace of carbon monoxide or any other gas, water element on Mercury. How are they going to explain it developing a comet tail? So, uh, you know, uh, it just, uh, so anyway, I'm, I'm very excited about this. We're going to have to see what develops but uh, uh, very exciting times. But oddly enough, uh, this is the initial date of the NERC, the North American Electrical Reliability and Safety uh, Corporation proposed uh, activity. It's like a, it's like a planned power outage uh, uh, drill. Which is also dangerous. It can actually cause power blackouts to nuclear reactors and blow parts of the actual physical structure of the of the grid. Yeah, they're very vague about what this is. Uh, if you ever read middle management verbiage, uh, like corporate, um, like uh, what would you call it, like a, a corporate goals or things like that. You know, when you read these, they're very vague. Mm, fuzzy. They, they say, yeah, uh, obtuse is the of, word. Uh, they're uh, they're t purposely obtuse so that if they do something, they say, well, we told you, but it's so obtuse yeah. you can never figure out what they're actually doing. And then they say, well, after it goes wrong, well, we said we told you, you know, you should have been ready for this. Yeah, I'm thinking, and so there's what? supposedly all kinds of government agencies involved in this, but they're not saying what they're doing. What's going to happen? Yeah, they're not, the they're not saying, are they going to do a station blackout to nuclear reactors to see how they scram or respond? They're not talking about how they're going to shut off parts of the grid to see if they are able to build up power distribution so it doesn't blackout large areas of the country. They're not telling us anything. They're not saying that they're going to have police officers on uh, different parts of the country. I mean, this is really uh, what I call scary and crazy activity when they have got no warning of what part we're going to play in the so-called national and international drill, Canada, the United States, Mexico. This yeah, is, and there, there's no reason for doing this because, in reality, 
we are at the lowest possibility in 200 years of having a solar flaring event. The only solar flares we've had recently are due to comets. The one a number of about a month ago, a comet came in. Before it hit the sun, it, you could see the spark coming out of the comet. It ignited the sun into a huge CME. And then Comet Ison, when it aligned with Mars and it started developing that sunward spike, wham, we get a big solar flare that actually hit Earth. We had red auroras the other night, also on uh, October 2nd. We had what you call red auroras. They're very low-latitude auroras. They're the most powerful kinds of auroras. And that was caused by that connection of Comet Ison with Mars. And... Uh, <laughs> You know, so the only solar activity we've had is due to comets, and it's something that NASA emphatically denies. So, the, you know, the situation is so bizarre, and uh, couple that with the, the, like I say, dozens and dozens of misinformation postings using my name, trying to use my work, and, and distort it. It just, you know, this is, I've never seen anything to, at this level. And then you couple that with the fact that NASA is shut down. We don't have a space agency. We don't have any instrumentation. And by the way, all that instrumentation is not run by NASA. I, I made a, a it's, very clear... It's run by one con contract, uh, contract, right? Well, the, the cameras, etc. There's a there's a company in California called Mellon Space Enterprises that filters all of the photographs, everything that comes from NASA what we consider NASA satellites and data is filtered through that company and probably some other ones that I don't know about. Um, but uh, so this information is still coming in, it's still going somewhere, it's still going into tier one science. Remember, tier one science is not shut down. Right. NASA is, but that's the tier two level. Right. It's shut and down, the public. No, you're one of the main scientists in the world, as corroborate what I've been saying for years, that we've had a bifurcation of science into Tier 1 and Tier 2, not just for centuries, but for millennia. But it's really become very acute in the last hundred years. And uh, the globalists who are crafting this want to make sure they literally are bifurcate civilization so they're not aware, not aware of energy, like as you say, from the solar system, solutions for environmental issues, as uh, the... Uh, Andy Schlafly, the attorney for the Association of Physicians and Surgeons, said with their book, their, their website, what's called Conservopedia, the primary problem worldwide is a lack of energy in third world countries, not food. If you have energy, you can grow crops, you can have transportation, you can do anything. The fact is you've written about this. They don't want to tell you that when you open up the Pandora's box of saying that comets are plasma objects and they're quite dangerous, but it also tells you there's limitless energy out there Literally all the problems they try to propose, including the peak oil and all the other garbage, and limiting the population in Agenda 21, is all a lie. Yeah, it's interesting that the, the Tesla towers would be most productive, would do the, the best job in the equatorial region of the Earth, and that's where most of the poverty third world countries are. So yeah. they would have yeah. the best access to literally free energy. Wow. So uh, stay aware. We're going to have ongoing reports next week with uh, Professor James McKinney. Thank you, John Moore and Morrison. Great okay. research have a good on all three. I uh, really did appreciate your hard work and your own program, of course. John and Ann, you're on Republic Radio right now. I think it's 6 to 7 a.m. Central Standard Time, um, Monday to Friday. Professor McKinney, thank you for your scientific uh determination to tell the truth and get it out to us. Take care, everybody. Take action. We'll be back live on Monday morning. Chuck Kresbar will be back on Monday afternoon as well.